For our next discussion on the future character of war and deterrence, I'm excited to welcome Commander of the United States Strategic Command, General Anthony Cotton, in conversation with Sally Donnelly, a founding partner at Hallis Advisors. We do realize we're the only thing standing between you and lunch, so we might speed this up. <laughs> First, I want to thank Stephanie Carter and Ely and the whole team. Uh, it's an inspiration to come to an event named after Ed uh, because I think he's inspired all of us to move faster, to break things in some cases, but uh, just really appreciate the opportunity to talk to General Cotton. Um, and as everyone knows, General Cotton is the commander of United States Strategic Command, which is responsible for nuclear op operations, deterrence, uh, missile defense, which is crucially important, always has been, but maybe now more than ever. But uh, General Cotton, did you know uh, Ash? Did you get a chance to work with him? No, but, but one of the things I would like to say is thank you for um, allowing me to speak in this venue. I think it's it's perfect uh, in, in the time and space that we are in um, as, as a nation and as actually as a world. But I, I, I tell you what, as I describe uh, my portfolio and the modernization efforts that are happening uh, within uh, the Department of Defense when it comes to nuclear enterprise, uh, Ash Carter's fingerprints are all over it. You know, whether you're talking about modernization of the ICBM leg, SLBM leg, in particular the B-21, um, his fingerprints are all over it. So we wouldn't be doing any of that type of work today if it wasn't for Ash Carter. And, and, and I just want to say uh, we're, we're doing our best to get this stuff right. So, uh, so give us grace as we continue to uh, uh, do this work moving forward. And, and thank you to the Carter family. Yeah, thanks very much. <clears throat> Before we get going into the meat of it, just if I could take 30 seconds, talk about your background. Okay. One, because you didn't go to the Air Force Academy, you went to a better school, <laughs> <laughs> NC State. You graduated in 86. <laughs> uh, you commanded at every level, uh, squadron, group, wing, and uh, major command. Um, and I also see that you went to a series of other schools. You just touch, touch and go, I guess. But an NC State grad going to UNC. Yeah, I went to the Kenya Flagler School. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a nice touch. I don't know how you had any time for Air Force stuff, but <laughs> congratulations. Well, it's not as bad as having a daughter who graduated undergrad from the University of North Carolina, you know, and have her dad, who's an NC State guy, pay the bills. <laughs> uh, but uh, we had a house divided flag um, in front of all of our houses while she was a student there at UNC Chapel Hill. But, <laughs> but it's all good. <laughs> Excellent. So down to brass tacks, right? Um, unprecedented changes in the strategic environment. So could you talk a little bit about how you see the current environment from your seat there at Stratcom? Yeah, absolutely, Sally, thanks. You know, I, I think, you know, Hazel kind of laid it out in his uh, presentation as well, but let me kind of hone that in from my perspective as a commander of Stratcom. So you know, if we really think about it, since the advent, and, and, and you said, uh, nuclear, you know, nuclear operation, nuclear deterrence. Uh, my portfolio is actually strategic deterrence, both by conventional and nuclear means, um, if warranted. Um, so when we when we think about that, um, I'm probably the second commander. My predecessor, uh, Admiral Richard, was probably the first. In which, um, in the long history of strategic air command, that then transitioned to United States Strategic Command. Did anyone in this seat have to worry about two uh, nuclear peers, right? Um, so, so that for us and our allies um, is, is the biggest change or evolution um, in what we're seeing um, is the fact that um, it's more than just the Russian Federation, and now it's also the PRC. My predecessor, you know, announced and talked about the breakout, and that is true and that is real. Uh, the PRC has a true triad. All three legs of, the, of, 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 uh, of, of a nuclear triad is in existence for the PRC, always has been. The other piece that we have to think through and think about is I call it profite versus neophytes in understanding, you know, what does that mean as a, uh, as a, a peer competitor that, 
that has nuclear weapons at the, at, at the numbers that they have, right? Frank, when it comes to the United States and Russia, um, we, we've been doing it for a long time, um, and there's some proficiency in understanding, you know, what, what responsibility that really holds. Um, I, I would love to, to ensure that the PRC understands, you know, what responsibility that holds um, now that you're also a, a potential parity peer when it comes to uh, uh, owning a triad. And may I just dig on that? Please. Bit? Um, do you see them taking on that responsibility seriously? And how do you help influence that through the U.S. government? Yeah, so, you know, there were some conversations earlier where we talk about relationships and having conversations. Yeah. That was one thing, even in the midst of the Cold War, yeah. you know, there were still opportunities to have conversations with the former Soviet Union. I think that's going to be incredibly important, and I know the current administration is doing just that to try to get that relationship and being able, if nothing else, at the military levels to have conversations in regards to, I would love to, to be able to talk to my counterpart. Right. I, I would I would love for for them to ask, you know, questions on how do you, you know, so how do you think yep. through um, protections and security and nuke surety and those type of type of things. Yep. Um, be, because we had that kind of relationship with the former Soviet Union yep. um, during the midst of the, the highest you know, days of the Cold War as well. So I think that 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 would be something that, yeah, if, if, if they were to reach out and say, sure, we'd like to have a, a conversation or a crosstalk. I, th I think I'd be for that, Sally. Makes a lot of sense. And since we're here talking about emerging technology, can you talk about a little bit how it affects your view of strategic deterrence and, and your how you... Yeah, yeah, thanks for that. I think when we talk about the emerging technologies that we're seeing here, it, it kind of goes back to where I was talking about two peers versus one. And to be frank, it's two plus, right? Because I think there's third-party influencers that I heard a lot of speakers speak about earlier this morning, uh, which comes into play when it comes to strategic deterrence too. So let me kind of highlight that really quickly and then we'll talk about the emerging threats <clears throat> that we're talking about as far as technology. When you, think about, when you think about a Russia or a China, um, um, I think maybe Hazel brought it up. Think about the influencers that come along as well. Uh, DPRK, um, Iran, uh, even things like Houthis who do things by proxy. Think about the additional proxy um, um, elements that can, that can drive a change in dynamics um, that can actually make its way to a, a, a dynamic of decision making for, for now a Russia or a China because there is a, a relationship there potentially. Um, and then now let's think about the emerging technologies that are a little different um, than when you know, when, when we had folks that didn't have to worry about cyber yeah. And, yeah. and commanders that were in my seat that didn't have to worry about space as a domain. Um, I thought that was a, a, a really good conversation with Secretary Kendall uh, and how he described um, the space domain and how I have to think about that, even though my dear friend Stephen Whiting, who is the commander of Spacecom, uh, we're hand in hand in understanding that because overall, it's about strategic deterrence effects in all domains, right? So how do we look at it different? I think um, the theory of strategic deterrence is absolutely sound. What we're going to have to do and what we've been doing is how do you adapt the theory of strategic deterrence? How do you adapt that in the current geopolitical environments in the world that we see today that is all domain, right. not just kinetic effects, it's non-kinetic effects, it's space, it's cyber, it's being, able to, it's being able to have conversations with all my fellow uh, combatant commanders because everybody has a, a influence on deterrence, uh, on strategic deterrence, whether it's conventional. Um, so, so those are the kind of conversations that we're having right now, Sally. I think you're having great effect. I was just at Indo-PACOM Command and Admiral Paparo, obviously, you're the expert, but he talks about what you're doing and uh, aspects of deterrence probably more than, I, I was very surprised how he's embraced it and knows he needs to work with you. 
So really good. I assume most combatant commanders are there. Yeah, we, I have a, a, a really great relationship. Um, you know, obviously a great relationship with all of them, but from a operator's perspective, um, there's a dynamic between myself and Chris Cavoli, for example, who is a UCOM commander, um, Long Aquilino when he was, and now Sam um, as an Indo-PACOM commander, um, as well as Tim Hawk, who's a, you know, you know, we do things hand in hand because of my NC3 um, capacity and oversight that I have uh, on behalf of, of the nation and the department. <clears throat> so, so when you think about all of that, um, uh, it's, it's kind of a collaborative effort yeah. to make sure that we can seamlessly you know, hopefully keep from that vertical escalation from happening. Yep. But, but if it does, it needs to be seamless in how that transition works. I'm, you know, I mean, that, that's an unfortunate statement to have to make as far as vertical escalation. But, but the reality is that, that that's why I'm a commander of, of, of strategic command is, is to be able to put those plans together if, you know, that unfortunate day, you know, could potentially happen. Yep. One other thing, if I could just hit on the emerging technology part of it, uh, artificial intelligence obviously now runs through these conversations and everything you're doing, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about how it's affected your command and your, you know, your team? Yeah. <clears throat> to be frank, I've, you know, I've heard, of, I've seen a lot of op-eds in regards to it, um, um, especially when it comes to my portfolio yeah. in, in regards of jumping to the conclusion that, you know, AI, ML will drive some sort of um, decision-making you know, piece. Uh, let's bring that back a little bit because that's not what we're talking about at all, uh, nor would we be ever interested in that. You're, there's always going to be a human in the loop to make that decision. Um, what does have to happen and what is happening, and, and we need an in sp speed of relevance, is all the things that, to be frank, I'll, I'll, I'll capture some of the words that I think the secretary said earlier, is how can you get things done at a speed of relevance? How can I make sure that there's things that absolutely, I can't get a man or woman to hunt and peck and get that data. Some of, you know, some of that data is gonna hit the floor. What can bring that data in a, in a great place where then um, decision makers have the most up-to-date information to make the right decisions that need to be made, right? That's like any war fighter. You know, I, I'm, I'm not any different than anyone else um, in, in regards to that break break i am not talking about taking away the ability for the commander in chief to make a decision uh, when it comes to my portfolio at all yeah. what i am talking about is how do i set the the space and give the the commander in chief decision space uh, where he or she can make the right decision right excellent one uh Part of the topic has been the role of allies and partners, and obviously STRATCOM is a unique command in some ways, but I assume you rely on allies and partners. They're fundamental to how we're going to go about deterring and, if need, fighting. Yeah, Sally. So, so I had an opportunity to see Sir Tony Radigan, um, who's a, a dear friend. I've known him since 2021 in my previous role when I was a, a commander of Global Strike Command as well. But you know, what's unique in, in what we have done in the last 18 months, I've been in Command of Stratcom for about 18 months now, is we actually have opened that aperture up a little bit. Um, um, we do better, we as a nation do better with allies and partners, period, dot. Um, my portfolio can benefit from allies and partners as well. Um, so, you know, part of my portfolio is is the assurance mission, yeah. right? So how do we assure allies that, uh, that we have extended deterrence effects um, when it comes to, you, you know, coming to the aid of an ally or, or partner, mm -hmm. right? I, I, I do that by opening the aperture in regards to um, meeting with the, the UK, for example, and the relationship that I have uh, with the United Kingdom, uh, the relationship that I have with um, Japan, you know, the, the Rock, um, Australia, and, and others. Because what we've introduced is people will tend to go, but some of those aren't nuclear power. They, 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 don't, have, they don't have nuclear weapons. Um, I, I don't need uh, a partner that all has nuclear weapons. Yeah. I, I, I actually need partners um, that can actually be part 
of being able to help us in a support role in what I call what they are best in breed in, right? So that could be um, how can you deliver um, for deploy things, you know, for some of my forces? Um, how can you do air refueling for some of my forces? How can you, um, you know, with the help of Tim Hawk, um, be able to do some other non-kinetic things um, that might not necessarily come from the United States um, to be able to make it so my portfolio um, can be more successful. And to be frank, it has landed, you know, because at first people will kind of say, well, we, we don't want to be, you know, we, we don't know how we fit and how we play in that space. And what we're finding is as we explain it, they're like, oh, yeah, we can do that. You know, we can, we surely can can have a, uh, a I call them T-tails. So, you know, like a 400 yeah, that might might have um, a, a NATO partner flag on it as opposed to a U.S. flag C-17 yeah. that's carrying supplies forward for me um, you know, when it comes to my air leg, as an example. Yeah. I'll do that kind of work. <clears throat> you know, once we explain it that way, um, it, it has landed. Yeah. And, and we're getting a lot of participation in regards to that. So. So we still have work to do, though. Was the initial sense you, you do nuclear weapons so, and we don't have them right. and we also don't want to. Right have that right. relationship. I, I, right. Uh, and, and, I, and I think the way you can kind of couch that and the way we've been couching that is um, I need to be able to have kinetic effects that are conventional, right? Everything I do is not about just nuclear effects, yeah. right? I can have kinetic effects because I'm the long range strike guy, yep. you know, for yep. the Secretary of Defense. That, that's, what, that's what I do at Stratcom. Yep. Um, that's, con that's either kinetic um, through conventional means or not. And we know what the other means are. Yep. Um, but, but to be able to have um, folks kind of understand that, that are, that are sitting right there, you know, as my teammates uh, has been very, very helpful. Yes. In the last eight and it's a bit of a new phenomenon. I mean, it's since you've It's been always there. been there. I yeah. think, I think we just had to have clarity and be yeah. able to ex explain um, how they can be teammates. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's working for us. Excellent. Well, I think that's a great way to end the conversation, talking about our teammates. So thanks for your time and thanks for being here. Well, I do have to say, though, before we end this, though, because you did mention that I went to NC State. So, so I'm pretty sure everybody was watching um, the, the NCAA you know, tournament and the fact that NC State uh, made it to the, you know. <laughs> that's right. We, we went much further than, than anyone had in, in, ever imagined. I was I was just reminiscing over my days of when I actually was a student under when Jim Valvano was there. That's right. Uh, and I thought maybe we were going to have a repeat of the cardiac pat. But That's right. Yeah, not so much. Next but, year. But, Next year. But thanks again. Anyway, like thanks a lot. Assist. And, and Thank thanks uh, once again to the uh, Ash Carter Exchange for everything that they've done. And, and looking forward to participating in this uh, uh, even more, uh, more so in the future. So thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah.